Welcome back to Cosmic Comics. I'm excited to be talking about a new character today as I continue to look at each appearance of the Watcher breaking his oath. Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Issues number 66 and 67, written by Stan Lee with art by Jack Kirby, published in 1967, gives us the first appearance of Adam Warlock. But I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to use this episode to follow through the full period of time spent as the character of him right up to the point before he becomes Adam Warlock. This essentially covers the time period that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby worked with the character. Three of the Fantastic Four have stopped by Alicia Masters' apartment so that the Thing can have an alibi for why he missed his date with Alicia the night before. The team had been facing off against Ronan the Accuser. To see my discussion on that, follow the link above. Much to the trio's surprise, they find her door unlocked and nobody home. Sue thinks she probably went shopping. The reader is given a great reminder that the puppet master is Alicia's stepfather by the marionettes hanging on the right-hand side of the panel. Ben is concerned that Alicia might not be shopping. After all, she might be out with some other guy. And Ben is back to repeating his complaints that Alicia will never be capable of loving a guy with a face like his and that Reed never came up with a cure for him. Reed attempts to comfort the thing and in return, Ben backhands his teammate. Sue scolds Ben over his actions, but the thing fails to show any remorse. He's upset that Reed is pitying him when instead, Ben would prefer Reed were working on a cure. After Ben slams the door on his way out, Reed sits up and, like so many victims of physical abuse, Reed blames himself. While Sue oddly touches his head, Reed stands up and tells Sue he's developed countless serums that would turn Ben human once more, but none of them would have been permanent. He never told Ben about these because he didn't want to disappoint his friend. Wow. Just wow. Maybe, just maybe, Ben might prefer a temporary potion to no potion at all. Especially if you've got countless serums. To add insult to injury, Reed pats himself on the back by insisting that he'll never rest until he finds a serum that works. But seriously, he works on other projects all the time. The focus then shifts to the beehive, a complex structure that looms high above a rocky plateau in the remotest spot on Earth. Exactly where the beehive is located is left a mystery. Inside the hive, two figures emerge from a glowing transfer grid. It is a man referred to as Hamilton and Alicia Masters. As they exit, Hamilton assures Alicia she's safe. Zoda congratulates Hamilton, but is told to shut up by Morlack, who is giving the orders. The other gentleman's name is Shinsky, and we learn that Alicia's blindness is what makes her valuable to these men. We're given the Beehive's real name, the Citadel of Science. Morlack introduces everybody as friends, while Hamilton explains that they are scientists who have retreated from the rest of the world to do a crazy experiment. Morlack introduces everybody along with their speciality. Hamilton is medicine, Morlack is nuclear physics, Zoda is electronics, and Shinsky is biology and genetic research. It turns out that these aren't your run-of-the-mill scientists. Each of these is world famous. Alicia is somewhat confused. She points out that each of them were supposed to have died in various accidents, These scientists have gone into hiding for a reason, but are not yet ready to divulge their purpose. Hamilton removes his space warper, which allows somebody to travel to any area on Earth. Wow, if only they would share that technology with the world, we would never have to wait in traffic again. But before the scientists will explain anything else, they insist that Alicia must first pass a test. They lead her up a ramp before a large block of granite. Her task is to carve the block into a bust of Morlack's head. Alicia seems daunted by the amount of time it would take to carve out a block of granite so large. She is then informed that they have ways of making the job easier, but first they want to know how she can sculpt things she can't see. 
Alicia gives a pretty by-the-book answer. No superpowers here, just years of study and practice. She goes on to explain how she uses her hands to study the contours of the subject she sculpts. More like ask her to begin while requesting that Zoda give her the Electrona Blade. At first, Alicia is confused by the name, but once she begins working with the tool, she understands. The knife allows her to cut through solid granite like butter. In a short amount of time, minutes, Alicia finishes the bust and calls her patrons over. All three men are astounded by her skill and seem confident that she's the woman they need to proceed with their mission. The thing is bummed out and has gone for a walk on the town. He's in heavy moping mode and he bemoans that there is somebody out there for everybody but himself. He's interrupted by a beat cop who is surprised to see him out and about like this and offers to help Ben out if he needs anything. Once more, Ben lets the sympathy get under his skin. At least this time he doesn't hit anybody. The cop can't understand it. He thinks that the thing has it made. He's a strong hero who everybody loves. As the two stand and talk, a crowd of young teens begins to gather around the thing, passing him compliments and asking for his autograph. Their teacher or mother arrives and asks the kids not to cluster around the thing. His response is to tell her he understands. He wouldn't want kids standing next to something as ugly as himself either. The lady takes a moment to explain. She wasn't worried about the kids. She was worried that they were bothering Ben. Ben seems embarrassed that she was actually thinking of him. She then leans in to tell Ben how great she thinks he is while giving him a kiss. She tells him she'll be the envy of every woman she knows. She then walks off, leaving Ben gawking after her. And again, the cop steps in to tell Ben that he's a lucky man, and people think he's the greatest. Wow, that was a full one and a third page set aside to telling us how great the thing is. As the thing walks away, he's got a fresh attitude towards his problem. He was upset about Alicia before he even knows what's wrong. He needs to find out where she is. For the first time this issue, we visit with the Human Torch. He's currently dating Crystal, an inhuman. He's dealing with the same fallout that Ben was having to deal with, having been pulled away by the Supreme Intelligence. Crystal makes it sound like Johnny had a choice in the matter, but she saw him disappear in a puff of smoke. She even goes as far as to chastise Johnny for not taking her along. As they are talking, Johnny begins to lose control of his flames and is going to crash unless she can help him. Her response is to shut her eyes. I'd say that's uncalled for, but it's Johnny who is acting the fool and putting on a show. Johnny attempts to talk his way out of it, but Crystal twists his words. When he attempts to give her a kiss, she unleashes her elemental powers, extinguishing Johnny's flame. What's most worrying is that Crystal did this before she could stop it. The two lovers go downstairs to the lab where they find Reed has pulled out his heat image tracer. It's a machine that projects a picture of past events by tracing any heat images remaining in the area. Sue, registering that Reed might not agree that Alicia went shopping, asks her husband if he thinks that Alicia is in danger. Reed gives it to her straight. Nobody saw her leave. Her purse was in her room, and she would never leave for an extended period of time without telling Ben. Three of the scientists walk with Alicia. This is a good shot, as it shows there are numerous employees working for the Citadel of Science. Alicia still isn't clear why they need a blind sculptor. Morlack prepares to tell her, but is interrupted by a sound coming from the other side of the wall. Almost immediately, the wall explodes while the scientists become afraid that an unknown foe is loose once more. Morlack calls for the guards, while Zoda calls for him to be stopped, and Shinsky bemoans that they are already doomed. The guards rush in and are ordered to shut down the safety hatches around Lock 4. The drama surrounding the secret of whatever is going on here continues as Zoda pushes Morlack to tell Alicia the truth. Shinsky's fatalistic outlook continues, 
while Morlack insists that with the help of Alicia, they still might be triumphant. It looks like Morlack is making himself a cocktail, but instead he's making himself something called a vitra broth to help relax Alicia. Not sure what is going on here, but after a small drink of the broth, Alicia begins to relax and feel her worries disappear. The way Morlack talks about things in this panel is odd, like he tells Alicia she's earned the right to an explanation. How? By drinking the drugs you gave her? He continues telling Alicia that their objective is to end war, crime, and illness through the creation of a perfect race of human beings. He refers to his group's purpose, but never gives the name of his group. Alicia wants to know how they plan to create human beings, a pertinent question since she's the only woman we've seen. Morlack gives us a flashback. He tells us how they isolated themselves in a remote location and dedicated themselves to their primary goal. None of them would leave until they created the first perfect human, the forerunner of a supreme new race. After years of labor, they created an embryonic creature and kept it alive in a life cell tank. They continued to grow their creation, carefully adding the correct conditioning chemicals, which allowed their creation to thrive. They continued to monitor and grow their creation into adulthood. Unfortunately, several days prior to the experiment's completion, something happened within the tank and an alarm was sounded. The guards on duty had orders from Morlack to enter the containment area should such an emergency occur. Once inside, the guards are astonished to see that the creation has freed himself from the life cell tank. The guards, afraid to shoot their guns and harm the experiment, are left with few options while they await for the scientists to arrive. As the trio of scientists race down the hall, Zoda wonders what they are going to do if they have tampered with something that they can't control. For this, Morlack calls him a fool, but Morlack looks surprised when he sees that the life cell tank is empty and destroyed. As Morlack approaches, the guards are running out of the chamber in fear, insisting that the scientists have no way of stopping him. It would have been nice if the artwork had made it more clear that the guards were retreating from the chamber, where Morlack notes that the experiment is still within the chamber because he can see its shadow moving from within. And why does it look like Zoda has fallen to the ground? Zoda seems very concerned that the experiment emerged too soon, as this means it wasn't ready yet. Whatever is within the chamber prepares an attack. Morlack asks Zoda to hand him the electroshock tube quickly. Morlack raises it up and blasts it into the chamber. Not sure what I was expecting from an electroshock tube, but that wasn't it. The tube is working, forcing him back. Morlack wants Zoda to turn on the light so they can look at their creation. Before they can flip the switch, Morlack finds himself thrown back against a wall and calls for everybody to pull back. The scientists escape from the chamber, having never gotten a good look at their creation. Since that frightful moment, their creation has started glowing so brightly that no human eyes can look upon it. Yep. They want Alicia to go in and rub her hands all over their nearly perfect human, and then sculpt a statue of him so that they can know what he looks like. Precisely. Do I need to elaborate on all the ways that this is a bad idea? Back in New York, the thing has arrived at Alicia's residence, and is surprised when the landlady tells him that Alicia still hasn't come home. In fact, she never even knew that Alicia had left. Much to Ben's surprise, she reports that the rest of the Fantastic Four are up in her room right now. Ben knows that if the rest of the team is involved, something bad must have happened. The thing continues up to Alicia's apartment, where he finds Reed setting up his heat image tracer. Ben begins apologizing for striking Reed earlier, claiming that he didn't mean to do it, but he did. Reed agrees with Ben's assessment and even takes on the responsibility of getting hit by saying that maybe he had it coming. Reed continues to dig this hole, telling Ben if hitting him made him feel better, 
that it was probably worth it. Wow, what an oddly abusive relationship. And then it all just gets brushed under the rug and nobody ever thinks about it again. The Thing wants to know if maybe one of their past enemies is behind kidnapping Alicia, but Reed insists that he won't know anything until the film gets rolling. And just like everything else, this causes an emotional outburst from The Thing, who seems to be suffering from some very real anxiety over not being capable of doing anything to help. Reed tells Ben to calm down. He's got his film. Not certain if Reed is carrying the film or the projector, as in the next panel, it looks like the film and the projector might be the same thing. I don't know. Ben grabs one of Alicia's mural boards for them to project an image onto. As for why a blind sculptor would have mural boards, I'm at a loss. Amazingly, Reed's invention works. Alicia is shown sitting at home and then hearing something else in the room. An unknown man in strange clothing approaches her. After a short conversation, the man offers his hand to Alicia. Either way, the two go off together. They disappear by walking through a wall. This panel very much reminds me of Red Ghost. Meanwhile, during the present, Alicia is suiting up for her mission. She's carrying a pack full of clay so that she can do her work in the presence of her muse. Hamilton informs Alicia that he will be joining her. She's surprised to feel that he carries a gun. She was told that this mission presented no danger. Morlack comes in and we learn the truth of the matter. Hamilton was never given permission to join Alicia on the mission. He's supposed to be working on other projects, but he took it upon himself to join her. Morlack warns Hamilton that he's breaking code of Citadel discipline, but Hamilton stands his ground. He was a man before he became a scientist. Whatever, they let him get away with it. The door to lock four is open, and as soon as Alicia and Hamilton are inside, the door is closed. As they move down the tunnel, Alicia lets on that she knows there must be more to the story. Hamilton admits that Morlack hasn't told her everything. The creature they seek has unknown powers, the likes of which they have no idea. A flaming barrier, not unlike the barrier we saw earlier in the issue, arises before our duo. Hamilton steps in to stop Alicia, but she already knows to stop from the radiating heat. Hamilton thinks the flame barrier is meant as a warning, but Alicia doesn't understand why. If the creature is so powerful, why should it take the effort to warn them? The story switches back to the Baxter building, where Reed Richards is attempting to locate Alicia. The thing is still grumbling, while Susan attempts to offer support. Reed emerges and asks them to be quiet. He then hands Ben a photo of a bracelet. Reed feels confident that the wristband is what allowed the man to walk through the wall. From this picture, and knowing a little of what it does, Reed plans to reverse engineer the device. From there, following the man through the wall to wherever he took Alicia. It seems like a long shot, but okay. And I have to stop and point out, Alicia went with this guy willingly. From everything the Fantastic Four have seen, it appears as though she went with him willingly as well. What business is it of theirs to go around setting up devices inside of people's homes that record by a heat signature what they did in the past so that you can spy on them in their own privacy? And also, it's a little rough on the landlady. Is she really going to say no to the Fantastic Four asking to get into Alicia's apartment? Alicia has seemed surprisingly on board so far with helping these scientists out, so maybe the Fantastic Four should just ease off. At that moment, Hamilton stands between Alicia and the mysterious him. Alicia can feel the presence of his hatred radiating outward, and thus ends the first appearance of Adam Warlock. But he's not Adam Warlock yet, he's just him, and... Come on, that wasn't much. Let's get to the real deal in the next issue. Issue number 67 begins with this great cocoon cover, and the teaser is a misnomer. At last, learn what lives within the cocoon. 
I remember reading that the first time I saw it and flipping back through issue 66 and even as far back as issue 65 just to make sure I hadn't missed an appearance of the cocoon. Nope, this cover is its first appearance. And again, on the splash page, Wynne opens the cocoon. We're told that Alicia has been taken to the Citadel of Science, but have yet to be told the name of the organization that took her. Reed Richards is hard at work replicating the bracelet. He's had all of the parts of the bracelets enlarged hundreds of times. This allows Reed to see the inner workings of the bracelet, something he has to explain to Ben in painstaking detail. It really seems like Ben should have caught on to all of this by now, and the explanation definitely goes on for a little bit too long. But Reed has all the info he needs, now all he's doing is waiting for the parts. The door buzzes and the thing is ready to chase off whomever is there so Reed can keep working, even though Reed just explained to him that he's only waiting on parts. And of course, the person at the door is the person delivering the micro units Reed ordered from Tony Stark. The items have to remain super sterile, and Reed has himself and the thing suit up into decontamination suits. Not sure how that's going to help things, since the rest of the lab isn't being sterilized. Once they get the suitcase in place, it appears as though they have it inside of some kind of special sealed chamber anyway. Good thing that the delivery guy arrived when he did, as the case opens via an automatic timer. Inside are a bunch of black dots, what Ben calls freckles. Reed explains that those freckles are the parts that are going to make the machine that's going to lead them to Alicia. This leads to Ben pulling off his hood and yelling at Reed to get on it. So, why did they need the suits again? It would have been nice to see a panel of consequences, such as Reed having to order an entirely new set of parts due to the thing's outburst. Back inside Lock 41, Alicia and Hamilton press ahead. They aren't sure how she is going to sculpt him if the creature doesn't allow Alicia to approach. As they walk, Alicia reflects on the irony that the scientists need a blind woman to see what their eyes cannot perceive. Hamilton tells us much of what we already knew as a form of a short recap here, all about the scientists creating a new form of life, but we do learn something new. For some reason, the scientists believe they will have no chance to destroy the creature until they learn what it looks like. What? what why? Can't they just fill the chamber full of a deadly gas and call it a day? No, instead, the fate of the world resides in a blind sculptor in a backpack full of clay. Hamilton dives to protect Alicia as another warning blast comes in. The most recent blast triggers something in Hamilton, and he starts unloading his gun directly ahead of himself, screaming that he has to destroy him. Alicia is understandably confused. She wants to know why, if they tried so hard to make a perfect being, why won't they give it a chance? Hamilton's response is rather lackluster. It's too deadly, too dangerous. They, they had no right. And then the real reason I think the scientists want to shut it down. They can't control their creation. Hamilton bemoans that he's too late. The creature has created a molecular wall around himself, causing Hamilton's shots to rebound back towards himself. The energy radiating off of the creature is so great that Hamilton claims that no eyes can penetrate the glare. Hamilton pulls Alicia to the ground in order to dodge the returning fire. As he does so, he claims he never should have brought her here, never should have listened to the other scientists. But Alicia tells him to stop saying that. She, perhaps because of her time dating Benjamin Grimm, remains an optimist, suggesting that maybe he isn't dangerous. It might be that he's frightened and confused because he doesn't know where to go or who to trust. Alicia walks ahead of Hamilton down the corridor while he calls her back, but 
Alicia is no longer speaking to Hamilton. She's started speaking to the creature and she tells it that she wants to help it. Upon hearing this, the creature causes tendrils to rise from the ground, trapping Hamilton while seemingly opening the path ahead for Alicia. Alicia moves ahead, unafraid, somehow knowing that the creature will guide her to safety. Elsewhere in the building, the three scientists watch the events inside of Lock 41 unfold via a closed-circuit TV scanner. Morlock mistakenly thinks that Hamilton is attempting to hold Alicia back, but Zoda is more worried about the fact that they have sent an innocent blind woman to her death. Zoda wants to know when the murdering is going to stop. Morlock's response doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, retorting that he never should have allowed all of these weaklings to join him. And again, Morlack bites into the meat of the story. They wanted to create a race of new beings on Earth, a race that would conquer mankind but still be controlled by the scientist. Zoda calls him mad. But I'm not sure what part of the plan Zoda is just now learning about that he's getting so upset, or if he's just so upset that they can't control their creation. Shinsky starts swinging his cane around and informs the others that while they've been worrying, he's been working. He's prepared a last-ditch emergency measure. Zoda seems doubtful, but Morlack wants to hear Shinsky out. Shinsky wants to take them all to level 7 so he can show them what he's done. The scientists travel to level 7 by a vacuum power. As they pass through, it is stressed how large the Citadel of Science is along with its remoteness, and that from the outside, it looks like a giant beehive. As the cart moves along, Shinsky doesn't see how they failed with such a perfect plan. Shinsky mentions cloning their creation by the thousands, and this lets us know that both Shinsky and Zoda were in on the mad scientist plot from the beginning. And as Zoda points out, the part that they failed on was the control apparatus. They made him too powerful to control. Yes, we are being given a tiny bit more information each time they rehash all of this, but this and the previous issue continue to repeat the same dialogue over and over and over again. Shinsky has created an anti-gravity transmitter. Morlack wants to know what good that will do. Once they step inside, Shinsky explains that all they need to do is hit the detonator, which will send forth an ultronic wave, which will surround him and draw him into the furthest reaches of outer space. Ah, from the remotest place on Earth to the furthest reaches of space, we want to keep this monster away from everything. Morlack loves the idea. By blasting him off of Earth, they can restart a new experiment. He seems excited about this. Only the second time, they won't fail. Wow, these guys are spending their days making superhuman humunculuses and just blasting their failures right out into space. Amazing. Johnny has arrived at the Baxter building at the crack of dawn in answer to a summons from Reed. He's a little myth that Reed made it out to be an emergency, and now that he's shown up, he hasn't seen anybody other than Crystal. Johnny comes across as rather clueless once Crystal informs him that the rest of the team has been in the lab working all night, with the Thing and Susan arriving to help hours ago. Johnny doesn't seem phased. He's more concerned that his toast isn't hot enough. He flames on to show Crystal the way he likes it. She doesn't react well to this, not the complaint to her cooking, but more to Johnny scaring her by flaming on in front of her face. When she tries to get him to apologize, he leans over and forcibly gives her a kiss. This entirely rude display of aggressive affection is witnessed by Ben and Susan, who have arrived to get some breakfast of their own. Sue puts on an apron and explains to Johnny that Reed wanted them all here when he finished his lab work. Ben keeps up his complaining about Reed not doing any real work, but Johnny isn't having it and calls him out. He knows that Ben knows what Reed is doing in there, and even the thing admits it. He just wants to complain in order to let off some steam. Sue has a better idea. Feed his belly. 
She's cooking him up a stack of wheat cakes. They come off the griddle in no time, already smothered in butter. The thing claims to be too upset to eat, but ends up eating anyway. After all, he doesn't want to hurt Sue's feelings. Reed walks in. He's completed the wristband. He lets Ben know that they'll be capable of going after Alicia now. He just wants to get something to eat. Ben is quick to point out that if this was his girl, they wouldn't be eating. They'd be moving. Johnny sticks up for Reed, pointing out that the guy hasn't eaten or slept in two days. Wow, that does seem excessive. The thing begins to back off, but Reed admits that Ben was right and asks one of them to warm up the micro-tool assembly unit so that they can leave as soon as possible. Back inside Lock 41, Alicia Masters presses ahead. A voice is guiding her forward, telling her that it can sense the goodness in her heart and is asking for her help. The voice tells her that it hates the others, that they are evil and only mean it harm. The voice calls for Alicia to keep coming forward. She tells it that she cannot see and no longer knows from where the voice is coming from. The creature doesn't know what she means by see. In comparison, it views her as small and weak. Alicia can sense that something is wrong. Despite all the power that the creature possesses, it still needs assistance. Alicia reaches out to touch it and hopefully better understand. She is surprised by the form she touches. Not a man, but a shell. The creature is encased within something. Alicia tells us that the cocoon feels alive, but not alive. The creature inside tells her that this is a cocoon from which it is about to be born and emerge anew. But for now, the creature feels weak and alone. Alicia, drawing upon her experience of dating Benjamin Grimm, lets the creature know that she will show it understanding and compassion. And because of the love she feels for Ben, she refuses to desert this alien life form. Back at the Baxter building, the crew is preparing to leave. Susan doesn't understand how this strip of magnetized tape and fly specks is the same wristband as the one in the photograph. Reed explains that the fly specks are part of a printed circuit which give the bracelet directional power. Reed just has to place the magnetic tape into his micro-tool assembly unit and the machine will do the rest. Once complete, the wristband looks like an exact replica of the one worn by the man who left with Alicia, although Reed chooses to use the word abducted. Sue is excited that the team will be going to get Alicia back. Reed then informs her that she can't go. Since they don't know what awaits them or how dangerous it might be, she has to remain behind. Sue kinda still wants to go when Reed informs her that it isn't a request, it's an order. Oh, that's how it is, is it? Even the thing steps in to say, by the sound of Reed's voice, she isn't going to change his mind and that she's just wasting everybody's time with her arguing. Somebody get Sue a sweater, cause it just got cold in here. Johnny also has Crystal safe behind, but only to look after Sue. Wow, Sue also needs a babysitter now? They have zero confidence in her. And whose hand is grabbing Crystal's forearm? Sure, we get a little chauvinism in old comics from time to time, but between Reed and Ben's insistence that Alicia was abducted and has no agency, and their shelving of... Susan, while on their way to save another woman, it just comes across as over the top. As the trio prepares to leave, the thing suggests that maybe they should be doing this from the same place that the mystery man did, but Reed assures Ben that the bracelet will bring them to the same place no matter where they use it. The human torch feels a little tingle like an electrical shock, and then they are gone. Sue freaks out, seemingly forgetting that this was part of the plan all along, as she screams that they disappeared just like Alicia. Crystal surmises that it may be some form of dimensional travel. Back at the Citadel of Science, the transfer grid begins to glow. 
the guys who work there forgot to turn off the setting for automatic entry, and why not? It's not like they were expecting any visitors or thought anybody else might have the technologies. As one of these gents says, there is only one wristband in the world, and it's in our vault. As our heroes step through the portal, Reed corrects him, letting him know that they have duplicated their technology. Johnny flames on, and the thing wants to know where Alicia is. From there, Johnny starts circling the guards up in a circle of flame, while they call for somebody to sound the alarm. Reed is also rounding up guards, as he has several of them covered. Literally. The thing, on the other hand, is looking for a release for all of that nervous energy he's been bottling up. He lets loose a clobber in time while destroying what equipment he can. Deep within Lock 41, Hamilton finds the tentacles have disappeared. Something has happened and he decides that he needs to go find Alicia. Hamilton also realizes that the blinding glow is now gone. Hamilton can see where the creature lies. He immediately recognizes the shell around the creature as a cocoon. This was an expected move. The scientists were afraid that the creature would end its life like this. Hamilton warns Alicia to get away from the cocoon before he enters his final phase. Alicia points out that Hamilton is supposed to be a doctor. He has an obligation to help, and right now the creature inside is incredibly weak. Hamilton stares at his work, claiming that it's too late to help with anything, the metamorphosis will be complete within seconds. Alicia seems confused. Isn't this the plan? Isn't this what was supposed to happen? Hamilton tells her the real plan. The scientist wanted to control the creature. They wanted the ultimate slave, but they needed to enslave him before the final phase. Once he enters his final form, nobody will be capable of stopping him. Again, Hamilton calls out his work as evil. As he points his gun at the cocoon, he looks back on everything. He gave up his career and reputation so that one day he and his three scientist buddies can rule the world with other people as his slaves. But now Hamilton wants to destroy his creation. Alicia is upset that she was brought here under false pretenses. She doesn't want to work for a bunch of tyrants. Hamilton lets Alicia know that they were also willing to sacrifice her in order to meet their overall goal. And in that moment, the creature strikes out with an energy blast, breaking Hamilton's gun into pieces. The protective blast causes the cocoon to begin to dissolve, but not so fast. We're back to the Fantastic Four, who are still fighting the guards. Ben's been told that Alicia is being kept inside of Lock 41. Somehow, the torch knows that that's on the other side of the place. Ben grabs the guy who is shooting at Reed, and that guy agrees to tell them where Lock 41 is located. 26 seconds later, the Fantastic Four and their little buddy are traveling along on the vacuum rail. They arrive at Lock 41, and the Human Torch effortlessly burns through the door. With that in mind, I don't know how they ever expected that door to be capable of stopping him. Further up the tunnel, the energy build up from the cocoon is rapidly increasing. Alicia is told to escape, but she doesn't know which direction to go. A voice informs them that Alicia need not be scared. No harm will come her way, but that the others must pay for the evil they had planned. Alicia attempts to explain nuance to the creature, explaining that Hamilton tried to help her, but he's already been buried. Content with his fate, since he feels he would be unable to live with himself after this, Hamilton dies, worried what his experiment will mean for the fates of the rest of mankind. With Hamilton dead, Alicia assumes that she's alone. And in that moment, the Thing steps in and tells her she ain't alone no more, and promises that she never will be again. Alicia is shocked that Ben was capable of finding her, as she says it's like a dream and wants to know how he did it. The Torch tells her not to worry about that right now. They need to get out of here. 
The human torch has been absorbing energy bursts with his body, but his flame is beginning to fade. It then goes out, and he asks Reed what is inside there that could be causing this. Reed isn't sure, but confesses that it holds more power than any living being should. Ben has scooped up a fainted Alicia and wants to focus on getting her out of there. Reed agrees he can feel the energy buildup still growing within the ground under their feet. In order to escape successfully, Reed tells his teammates that they need to reach the same machine they came in on. The grid. In another part of the beehive, Zoda, Morlock, and Shinsky watch. Zoda recognizes the Fantastic Four, but Morlock isn't concerned with them as they are currently fleeing. Shinsky is more worried about the dangers of their creation. Zoda speaks up, suggesting they use the anti-gravity transmitter, and Morlack seemingly changes his mind from earlier. Previously, he was all about the device and praised the possibility of starting over. Now, he chastises the idea, stating that once they use it, all of their work will have been in vain, but Shinsky thinks it's their only option. The time for action is now. Shinsky plunges down on the device. This seemingly brings on an entirely new set of problems. One might be wondering how they were paying all of those guards and other employees. The scientist hired the world's deadliest crew of cutthroats, promising them great rewards. Because hiring those guys would never have backfired over the long run, right? Shinsky is shocked. Even though he pressed the plunger, the device failed to activate, as though out of power. Morlack says that they should have realized that him can read human minds, and that he must have neutralized the transmitter with his thoughts. The room the scientists are in explodes, and like the Fantastic Four, they too realize that they need to reach the grid to escape. The Fantastic Four are almost to the grid. Along the way, the Thing wonders why the guards aren't also attempting to escape. Reed points out that there is most likely only the one bracelet that works with the machine. The Fantastic Four make a point of not helping out the goons, and the Thing even thinks that they deserve whatever fate befalls them just for working for the guys who kidnapped Alicia. The guards begin looking for Morlack while the Fantastic Four escape through the grid. The scientists are within a thousand yards of their goal, but fear that they can't make it. The creature is caught up with them. For the first time, the three scientists lay eyes upon their creation post-metamorphosis. Morlack proclaims him to be everything that they wanted him to be and more. Creators and creation stand face to face. The creation lets them know that he is aware of their evil plans, and because of such, he has no reluctance doing what must be done. One might think he would angrily destroy the scientist or the beehive in which they reside, but instead he tells them that he is aware that this planet of humans is not for him, for at least another millennium, with millennium being misspelled. The scientists are afraid that if he uses enough energy to leave right now, then he'll destroy them in the process. The creation has a great reply. Does the tiger concern himself about the flea? Well, probably if the flea is biting the tiger, or if there's a bunch of them. Anyway, the creation takes credit for saving mankind from the beehive as it departs, but he remisses that there may come a time when... The legend is told of the time a cocoon opened up and proved that the child is father to the man. What? Why? Why is child father to the man and what does that have to do with the cocoon opening up? I can't help but feel that this is just comic book posturing and words to close us out. The same team up of Stanley and Jack Kirby bring him back almost two years later in Thor Volume 1, Issues 163 through 166, published in 1969. As we can see here in Issues 163 and 164, these are nothing more than teasers. 
Issue 165 brings him to the cover, holding a distressed Lady Sip. The opening splash also pronounces him in large letters. Thor, Sip, and Baldar have faced down the legions of Pluto. We learn a couple of panels in that the heroes stood like that on the splash page for over an hour while they had troops parade past them. Thor is ready to move on to the next task. He points out a building in the distance that holds an unknown being. It's unclear how Thor knows this. The commanding officer seems surprised that there is somebody still inside the city's atomic research center. Or as Thor points out, Mayhap, something. Thor asks permission from the commander before investigating, and the commander gives him the go-ahead and offers to keep troops posted in case they are needed. As the heroes walk towards the entrance, the commander reminds them that whatever they find in there is government property, so don't damage stuff. Before Thor walks in, the CO wants Thor to level with him. What does he expect to find inside? Thor gives us a cryptic answer. He seeks one who isn't mortal. Thor enters the building, with Baldur and Lady Sif following behind. Baldur marvels at the technology, while Lady Sif points out, so far it's been more quiet than dangerous. But in the next panel, she begins to pick up on a maddening aura of alien power. At the same time, Baldur hears something. Thor agrees. Ahead is a distant hum, growing louder, possibly coming from the chamber ahead. The group is caught within a dazzling radiance, seemingly blinding Balder. The entire building begins to tremble and shake via some strange force. An immortal power has been unleashed. At the end of the glowing hallway, we the reader are taken behind the door where we see a figure rising. As he does so, the cocoon begins to break apart around him. The words on the page say that the cocoon is gray, but the colors on the page are brown. The man continues to rise, bursting forth from his husk and proclaiming to be born once more. Initially, he is confused. He had fled the earth, but something has brought him back to the planet of his birth. He begins walking down the hallway, and as he does so, he meets our heroes. Thor introduces himself, but that could almost come off as a challenge. We're given the response in a great splash page. I am less than human, man. Far, far more than man. I was created by those who sought to father a new, all-powerful race. They were evil, and I destroyed them. Now only I remain who have no name. I must only be known as... Him. This is all the recap I thought needed, but it goes on for another page. At least this time we get the events from the perspective of Him. Him was initially formed within the cocoon on the remote island. From the moment that he awoke, he knew that his creators had made him with evil intentions, so he killed his masters. Afterwards, he was made sick by the thought of what he had done, and because of that, he didn't want anything else to do with the human race. He used the powers he was given to leave the planet and seek his destiny among the stars. Somewhere along the way, he was drawn into a space trap where meteors exploded all about him. He had to escape quickly or he would die. Afraid of dying and brought on by the thoughts, a new protective cocoon began forming about the man. Just before the world was blotted out of his sight, he saw a starship hover into view. He doesn't know who it was and from that moment on he was blinded by the cocoon. Inside of that craft, is the Watcher. It was he who set up the space trap to draw in meteors for study. He wasn't expecting to catch any living creatures. The Watcher introduces himself as one who was sworn to roam the galaxies to study and observe. And of course, he mentions his oath. Never may he interfere in the affairs of others. The Watcher then admits that he has broken his oath, although he didn't mean to, and he has altered the course of another's life. The Watcher seems to believe that two wrongs make a right and decides to break his oath a second time. In his words, the Watcher must tamper with that which is and change the fickle fabric of what may be. He says all this to make himself feel better, but 
Nobody is forcing his hand. These are choices that he is making. The Watcher decides that since the creature came from Earth, it should return to Earth. He then goes so far as to open a U.S. space laboratory satellite and stick the cocoon inside like it's lost cargo. So the satellite carries the cocoon back to Earth. But as Stan points out, him does not know about these events or how he came to be returned to the Earth. Thor lays down the facts the way he sees it. It's wrong to hate humans when they could teach you so much. But him doesn't care to entertain this line of conversation. He is him. He is truth and law unto himself. Okay, not sure that last part was needed. The next panel switches gears pretty quick. Him explains that he's lonely and he wants a mate. Lady Sif, well, she looks pretty good, so he chooses her. Thor, who isn't married, steps in and professes his ownership of Lady Sif by saying she's his. Lady Sif doesn't complain. Instead, she points out that the creature in front of them acts like a child who doesn't fully understand what he's saying. Him is done conversing. He puts his hand on Thor's hammer and explains that all of them need to leave, except Sif. Thor gets back in him's face, warning him that he doesn't want to make Thor angry. In response, him calls anger a petty emotion that he doesn't care for, and uses his powers to toss Thor and Balder backwards. He then picks up Lady Sif, who calls for him to stay his hand. Again, she thinks he doesn't know what he's doing. Either way, he's getting what he wants. The only thing he knows is that he's not leaving alone. Thor holds back from striking with his hammer because him carries Lady Sif, and he's then surprised when him raises his hand and creates a solar vortex. It spins faster and faster and glows brighter till even Odin's power couldn't stop it. And then they are gone. Balder points out that the only explanation is that he left and fled to another dimension. Thor vows to find Sif. Thor begins swinging his hammer around while pulling Balder to the side. He is going to use it to follow him. Just like for him, Thor opens a solar vortex and Thor and Balder begin to disappear. They reappear on alien soil. Balder claims to have never seen such a barren place such as this, but Thor doesn't care. He sees Sip in the distance. Him is surprised to see that he was followed. Even as Thor and Balder approach, Lady Sif asks them to stay their hand, as Him has yet to hurt her in any way. Again, she thinks of Him as a confused child. If that's all it is, then Thor doesn't see any reason why she shouldn't step off of Him. Thor is ready to back off if Him will vow, but... Before Thor can finish his sentence, him cuts him off with a bolt to the chest, claiming that he makes no vows. Thor is laid out full on from this blast. Balder approaches, sword drawn, claiming him shall have to answer to his blade. But before Balder can strike a blow, he is hurled backward by a force blast, which shakes the ground with the energy of a hundred earthquakes. Him makes a good point. He doesn't need weapons. He is his own defense. He is power itself. Thor, not one to be abated, says his only choice is to destroy him. Balder calls for Thor to check out whatever is forming behind Balder. Okay, um, real quick. Carnilla, Queen of the Norns, uh, and a plotline I didn't touch on yet, has summoned Hag, the seeress, to help her after being rejected by Balder. Uh, Odin has placed Balder outside of Carnilla's reach, so instead she's using Hag as a workaround to reach him instead. The two have been watching and waiting for the right moment to strike, which is now. So the Hag reaches through dimensions and grabs Balder. Thor calls for her to unhand him before warning her that their fight isn't with her. The hag finds this humorous, pointing out that 
Is he not the son of Odin, and does she not serve the Queen of Norns? This makes the fight between the two of them ongoing and never-ending. And if she strikes now, then Thor won't be capable of following, because he'll prefer to save Lady Sif. But Thor isn't planning on pursuing. He plans on winning. Thor strikes at the hag, and it does nothing. Due to the enchantment, not even Thor's hammer can interfere now. Balder calls for Thor to abandon him in favor of Sif, but Thor isn't ready to give in. He tells Balder to avert his eyes from the power he is about to unleash, power that neither man nor god can bear its burst. Thor unleashes from throughout the entire universe the fury of the thunder and the carnage of the storm. The blast rages forth, and in the tendrils of smoke that remain afterwards, Balder is free. Thor turns to save Lady Sif, but his attentions were elsewhere for too long. Both Lady Sif and him are gone. Balder points out that they can use his hammer like they did last time. Thor is worried. Him might be wiser, and he got a much longer start this time, and Thor is shocked by his his own idea. What, what if him goes beyond the range of his hammer? Oh, wait, so, so there's a range? Earlier in the issue, Thor said, None may go where the mystic Majorna may follow. This is the exact same issue. Balder attempts to take the blame, but Thor informs him that he's not looking for a scapegoat. He's looking for the lady who holds his heart. And once Thor ensures that Lady Sip is safe, he plans on getting vengeance. He lets off some steam with a lightning bolt arcing off his body in every direction, with the tagline for the next issue being, A God Berserk. And from the cover of the next issue, uh, number 166, it looks like Thor will get his rematch. The issue picks up right where the previous one left off. Thor gives us a quick recap, and then we get to see the Thunder Gods freak out at the end of the last issue, up close and personal. Balder recognizes the danger and attempts to stay his friend's hand, afraid that his rage might drive him mad. Thor cares not about the madness, only revenge as he shoves Balder behind himself. Revenge as Thor strikes at the earth. Revenge as this barren land bursts into flames. Revenge unlike anybody has ever known. Thor doesn't care if Balder calls him mad, and with that he tosses his hammer. It flies forth, destroying a natural formation. Thor is prepared to give up his sanity for more power. The burst of Thor's hammer pushes the rocks onward, buffeted by the blow. Thor calls the hammer back and his friend to his side. Thor is ready to travel, although Balder still fears his anger. Thor is ready to strike out, to seize, and to slay. Again, Thor transports himself and Balder to an alien world. Balder points out that in all his time of knowing Thor, he has only known him to strike out in defense. Never once did the Thunder God crave battle. As they approach, Balder attempts to temper Thor's enthusiasm with a little caution, reminding him that their foe can read their thoughts and thus they will not catch him by surprise. The Thunder God stays silent in their journey until Balder requests that it is he who should face off against him, as it was Thor's saving Balder that allowed him to escape with Lady Sif. But that's when Thor finally speaks up and tells him no, and insists that this is his cause. Again, Balder raises the concern of Thor being under the spell of the warrior madness. He's afraid that Thor might lose the battle due to clouded judgment or kill when he doesn't have to. As he mentions his fears, he is beset upon by a series of roots beneath his feet wrapping around Balder, gripped by the madness. This time, Thor refuses to help his friend. He pushes ahead to fight alone. This stands in contrast to... Thor previously assisting Balder and shows that Thor has completely given in to the warrior madness. Him explains that he mentally commanded the roots to hold Balder because his fight is not with Balder, and as for Thor, him wishes no harm to the Thunder God as well. Thor seems insulted 
at the very idea that him could harm an immortal. Thor throws his hammer, and it strikes him and bounces off of his chest. He explains he is not born of man or woman. He was created to be invincible, and he was made well. Thor calls back his weapon, and even though him can stand against the blunt force of his hammer, Thor will still find a way to defeat him. Him starts to get a little huffy. Hey, why do you hate me so much? I haven't done anything to you. And the female you're worried about, well, she's safe in an aerospace bubble where she can't be hurt. He goes on. I've been stuck in a cocoon and I've been super lonely. So when I came out, I found a companion. Isn't that what you would do? Thor, though, he isn't listening. All he sees is Lady Sif being dangled in front of him. Thor tucks in his hammer and decides to take him down one-on-one. He calls for him to defend himself as Thor rushes in. Him tells Thor that his mind shield will defend him against any weapon, but he doesn't need it against a living creature because he is stronger than Thor. He agrees to meet Thor on equal terms. And in the first part of this clash, I'd say that him comes in with the better of the two blows. As him gets his hands on Thor, he can see that the Thunder God is startled by his strength. And he calls Thor out, explaining, I am more than man, more than Thunder God. I am him. All he wants to do is live in peace with the lady of his choosing, but if he has to fight for her and him, he will. Thor finds he still has some fight in himself, starting with the insults. It wasn't my strength, but the thought of Sif with one such as thee, a thought Thor can't endure. And with that, he tosses him back, and as him lands upon the ground, Thor leaps forth with fury, screaming, no mercy. As Thor begins pummeling him, a voice cries out across the battlefield. Baldur attempts to warn Thor that the being acted out, but not in malice. But in the end, Baldur gives up. The warrior madness has overtaken Thor. In his rage, Thor tosses him down the hill before calling on him to rise to his feet once more. Him answers the challenge and moves in to grapple Thor, who tells him not to clean, but to look into his eyes where he'll find no reprieve. But Thor doesn't want this fight over too soon. He wants to enjoy his vengeance. Again, him is cast down upon the ground, and again Thor calls out to him. He knows that he still lives and taunts him to rise once more. Him looks up. He tried to fight fair, but he was beaten. Now, to save himself, he uses his mind power to hurl boulders towards Thor, who is undeterred by the giant missiles. He runs forth, striking him once more. As Thor beats against his opponent, he notes that it is not the same thing as beating against living flesh. Him cannot even feel the blows because he wasn't made to no pain. Meanwhile, back in Asgard, The Astrologer Royale of Asgard has run across Thor while scanning distant worlds, looking for Galactus. The Astrologer has called on Odin to witness his finding. Odin seems disappointed in what he has found. Never did he think a member of his family would succumb to warrior madness. Odin, looking on, notes that in a fair battle, he who has fallen must be granted leave to make surrender. The only affliction that would stop his son from doing so would be warrior madness, a forbidden malady. And any warrior stricken must pay the penalty, even if it be Thor. Back on the distant world, Thor is getting angry as a cocoon begins to form around him. He's super angry that his vengeance will not be met, that his foe is attempting to seek shelter. But at the same time, Thor is ignoring the rules of fair battle. As the cocoon forms, Thor discovers that he can't tear apart the quickly forming husk. Soon, him is completely encased within the cocoon. 
Afterwards, bolts of energy lance outward from the cocoon. So bright are they that Thor has to close his eyes, lest he be blinded. From there, the cocoon takes off into space. As Thor says, Thor hath battle won, but victim lost. The cocoon slows down once it reaches the safety of space, drifting until it is time to open once again. Afterwards, Thor's head aches as a cloud lifts from his brain, and then Thor hangs his head in shame as he realizes that he allowed warrior madness to possess him. He knows that he was the less worthy foe. With him being gone, the arrow spear floats to the ground, and thus Thor feels somewhat vindicated, as though he did not fight in vain. As Sif is released, Thor is happy she is free, but perhaps there was still damage done. Immediately, she calls Thor out for the injustice of his actions, extracting his vengeance upon an innocent creature. Even as she dives into Thor's arms, Sif bemoans the fact that she's never seen him so cruel, so merciless, and lacking in compassion. But in the end, she puts the faults on the warrior madness, not on the man she loves. As for Thor's punishments, I'll talk about that on another occasion. Him next appears almost three years later in Marvel Premiere Volume 1, Issues 1 and 2, written by Roy Thomas and Pencils by Gil Kane, published in 1972. This is where we finally see him take on the name Warlock. But before I can discuss that, I need to talk about the High Evolutionary. This wraps up the appearances of Adam Warlock during his time as him. The first two issues in the Fantastic Four, I feel like those two could have easily been combined into a single comic. Things were really getting stretched out there. It felt as though as the mystery was held on to for far too long, especially with such a small payoff at the end, while at the same time it repeated the same information over and over again. The Thor story, on the other hand, was much more exciting and seemed to move at a very rapid clip. It's also good to see that the character of him continues to evolve from one story to the next. The Thor story feels like a strong continuation of the events we've seen so far, despite that slow start in the Fantastic Four. Thanks for watching Cosmic Comics. Feel free to hit any of those buttons below. I'm out.